Let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Story from the book of Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham. God said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son, laid it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Such a difficult difficult story. We would be hard-pressed to find a story in the Bible that has provoked more commentary than the binding of Isaac. Our own Peggy Hilliard focused her master's thesis on this passage. Soren Kierkegaard wrote an entire book on it. Kierkegaard recalls how he heard this Bible story as a child. The older he got, the more enthusiastic he got about the story, while at the same time, understanding it less and less. He lets his imagination lead the way in pondering the different feelings and thoughts that Abraham might have had in this untenable situation. Kierkegaard is one of countless different perspectives from which to approach this story. From a literary perspective, this passage probably could not have been written more masterfully. The narrator lets the readers know a valuable piece of inside information from the very beginning. This is a test. God tells Abraham to take his beloved Isaac to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. The writer underscores just how special that bond is between father and son. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. So without any further dialogue, Abraham rises early, saddles his donkey, and gathers up Isaac and two servants. He cuts the wood for the offering, and the group heads out on a three-day journey that ends up at the base of Mount Moriah. Abraham leaves the two servants behind as he and Isaac head up the mountain, with Isaac carrying the wood and Abraham carrying the knife. Where's the lamb? asks Isaac at some point. God will provide, his dad answers. The intensity builds. Abraham stacks the wood, ties up Isaac and places him on top of the stack. 
Then it's like the action slows down. The camera zooms in, and there is Abraham raising his arm, knife in hand, to slay his son. An angel intervenes in the nick of time, and a ram takes the place of Isaac on that stack of wood. Telling this story, even knowing how it comes out in the end, just telling it makes my heart race. From an ethical and cultural perspective, this is a story that some skeptics of the faith have pointed to and said, why would I want to worship a God who demands child sacrifice? Well, obviously, we don't demand it, and we never would. Instead, we do all that is humanly possible to keep our children safe. In Abraham's context, though, child sacrifice was part of Canaanite and Phoenician religious rituals, but that was not to be the practice in the Jewish culture. Some point to this story for where that shift happens between human and animal sacrifice. There's much to ponder from a psychological perspective. There are lots of gaps to fill in because the narrator doesn't tell us any of Abraham's inner workings, just what was the level of pain or fear or sadness in his heart? Did he have steely hands? Or were his palms wet with sweat? Perhaps he doesn't say anything because he's at a loss for words. And then there's the theological perspective. Jewish interpreters lift up the ram as the most important part of this story. They mark it as the symbol of divine intervention in stopping Abraham short of taking his son's life. It's why a shofar, a ram's horn, is blown on Rosh Hashanah. It's a reminder that God will keep God's promises. For this Christian and for lots of others, there's that big, looming question that can be boiled down to one word. Why? Why? As one commentator expresses it, the command of God challenged Abraham to embrace the absurd, the irrational, and the unintelligible. What sense did it make to murder the son of promise through whom God had promised to bless all the earth? What in the world was God up to? Now, if you were here last Sunday, you know that it was little two-month-old Cedar Jarnikin's first time in worship. The entire family was present, including Cedar's grandmother from Oregon. It was an inspiring moment when Daddy Parker stood and held up Cedar, Cedar for all of us to see, reminiscent of Mufasa holding up little Simba <laughs> in The Lion King. Because they were seated about three pews back from the front, I tootled spontaneously down the steps, at the end of the announcements to spend a quick moment with the little guy. And as I reached for Cedar, Parker instinctively asks, what are you going to do with him? <laughs> and Parker and I chuckled about that after worship, and I'm sure my impromptu act helps to underscore why Presbyterians tend to sit near the back of the sanctuary, <laughs> fearing what the pastor may do next. But that question from Parker... That question from Parker took on deeper significance over this past week as I plunged into this passage from Genesis. I'm not a parent, so I can only imagine what that bond feels like for a father or a mother. I know I've heard many a mother talk about that mama bear inside of them that wants to or actually does come out and spring into action if their child is even perceived to be in harm's way. I'm guessing there are lots of mama bear and papa bear stories that we could share here this morning. What was God up to in this unsettling account? This wasn't just any child, mind you. This was Isaac, the child that was the embodiment of the covenant that God made with Abraham. This was the child upon which not just any promise, but the divine promise rested. This was the entire Israelite community as a people stacked on that wood. The entire future of all of those who trace their ancestry back to Abraham rested on the outcome of this story. Abraham had pulled up stakes, uprooted the life he knew, and headed out into the unknown because God said, your descendants will be more than the stars in the heaven. And here, with the impending plunge of a knife blade, that promise was about to bleed to death. Only now... Do we see how serious faith is, writes Walter Brueggemann. And the thing is, 
Abraham didn't argue with or question God. He had pushed back earlier when God first told him he'd be the patriarch of many generations. What will you give me? How will I know? He'd laughed earlier when God told him and Sarah that they would be first-time parents in their very old age. But here, here where the stakes were higher than they had ever been, here, Abraham did not push back. What he said was, here I am. Here I am. So, is this a story about Abraham? Or is this a story about God? Is this a story about Abraham's faith in God, or is this a story about God's faith in Abraham? The passage begins with, it was after these things that God tested Abraham. And these things were fairly significant. Yes, Abraham had left his homeland, but along the way, Abraham had also passed off his wife Sarah as his sister to strangers to save his own skin. Yes, Abraham had fathered the boy Ishmael with Sarah's servant Hagar at the insistence of Sarah because she and Abraham were not succeeding at getting pregnant. But after Isaac was born, Abraham had dispensed with Hagar and Ishmael at Sarah's insistence. Her jealousy had gotten the best of her, being afraid that Ishmael was going to usurp Isaac as the favored one. So Abraham took him to the edge of the desert, gave him a pittance of bread and water, and then turned his back on them. One commentator notes, Abraham is a man who has shown that he has no problem sacrificing members of his family. Granted, he has not volunteered, nor has he been called upon to do violence personally to any of them. He has nevertheless given their bodies over to certain suffering. And so after these things, Abraham was tested by God. And lo and behold, that test involves yet another one of Abraham's family members. He's put in a life and death situation by none other than the guy who doesn't have such a good track record. Think about it. Most readings assume that what Abraham did on Mount Moriah met with God's approval, writes my Old Testament professor David Gunn. He says such a reading, however, leaves the character of God in a rather sticky situation. At the very best, one might assert that God is simply unfathomable, at the worst, God is deranged and sadistic. Suppose, however, that God is well aware of Abraham's tendency to forfeit his family to danger and uncertainty. What if the test is really designed to see just how far Abraham will go when self-preservation is at issue? Perhaps God needs to see if there's ever a point where Abraham's willing to sacrifice himself rather than his family. It's a different take. Others have taken it a little bit further. What if the real test was whether Abraham was willing to stand up like a real father for himself and for his family and say, no, no to death, no to killing, no to looking out for himself first? What if Abraham's leap of faith was a leap in the wrong direction? So did he pass the test? Was Abraham a man of exemplary faith, completely obedient to God and knowing full well that God would provide as God always had, even as the stakes grew ever higher? Or did he fail the test? Was Abraham a man who was deeply fearful and weak-kneed and self-centered who could not come through even as his son's life lay in the balance? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know what I do know is that either way, God came through and kept intact that promise to Abraham. Right after this morning's passage, in the same chapter of Genesis, an angel of the Lord reiterated the blessing. I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. God tested Abraham. Does God test us? If truth be told, I struggle a bit with the word test. It isn't a term that Presbyterians roll off of our tongues frequently. The definition of test is a critical examination, observation, evaluation, or trial. It's the means by which the quality or genuineness of anything is determined. To prove 
to prove may come closer to the meaning of the Hebrew in the sense of proving where the limits of a metal are before it's broken. I don't know if God tests us. Be that as it may, I do think that all along our life's journey, we are faced with making choices. Do we keep or do we give away? Do we go or do we stay? Do we befriend or do we pass on by? Do we speak up or do we remain silent? Bottom line, God does ask us to be all in in our relationship with God. At some point, God expects us not to let anything stand between us and God. And at the same time, God provides the faith we need to be all in, even when we stand on the equivalent of Mount Moriah, weak-kneed and terrified. Even then, God provides, as God always has. What God asks in return, in the words of Jesus, is that we are both welcoming and generous. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones Truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. God tested Abraham. Did Abraham pass? Did he fail? Either way, either way, God provided. God delivered on the promise, as God always has, as God always will. Amen.